Hello, everyone. Welcome to our show. My name is Tim Hayden, and I'll be your host. We have another great show today. We have the lovely and talented Sonia Satra. Sonia is an actress, producer, motivational speaker, author, and entrepreneur. She's best known for her role as Lucy Cooper on The Guiding Light and Nurse Barbara Graham in One Life to Live. She's here to talk about her acting career and about her in- innovative motivational fitness and more. Please welcome Sonia Satra. Hey. Welcome. Hi there. How are you? Great. I'm glad you could make it today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. This is such a it's such a great purpose. I love your your mission and your passion for really helping others. And so I'm I'm really glad to be here today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I guess we'll start way back at the beginning. Um, when did you think discover that you wanted to be an actor or actress? I was definitely late in the game on that discovery. Uh, I was in high school. Uh, I think I was like 16 and I was playing tennis with my mom and just in our community. And this guy approached us and asked if I was interested in doing a hair ad. Now, 16 year old, right? Free haircut, you know, good product. I was like, sure, that sounds fun. And so I did this local hair ad uh, for, and someone in the community and it was really fun and I had a great time and I uh, got great shampoo and conditioner. <laughs> That's <laughs> always nice. <laughs> Didn't take much back then. <laughs> uh, but then I, uh, I went to college and I thought, well, gee, maybe there, maybe I could do some part-time modeling just to earn some extra cash in college. And <clears throat> I didn't know anybody or anything about the industry. And so I did what you should not do, especially back then, was look in the back of the New York Times at Help Wanted. And wow, there's a lot of scams back there. And uh, I definitely found one of them. Uh, and my mom took me in and it was one of these like, yeah, give us $10,000. We'll make you a star. And uh, wow. I did not have $10,000 luckily. So there was no question whether or not I was going to do it. But it started the conversation. And uh, my mom had, this was as close of a contact as we had. A friend of a friend of a friend worked at a Spanish <laughs> television station. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> She recommended an agency. I went in and they were like, really, you should go to a children's agency because I looked really young. So they sent me somewhere else. I'm still thinking modeling. I got my little portfolio of pretty average pictures. And I get there and they had me read all this commercial copy. It was like a Pizza Hut script or something. And they were like, that was great. You know, would you be interested in doing this? And I thought, okay sure and uh so I, I honestly i just had that beginner's luck with commercials i had that sort of look that counter girl look um in the beginning um i did a mcdonald's that was like my third audition i booked a <laughs> national mcdonald's commercial and then i did burger king Kentucky fried chicken pizza hut burger <laughs> heaven wendy's all of them <laughs> i hope you got so. some food out of that <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that food. Oh, that's so disgusting. Actually, I did learn that's one of the food tricks of uh, commercials when they have you eat a lot because they really, especially the the chicken, the Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, the first couple pieces taste delicious, but when you get to like your fiftieth take, you've kind of had it on the you know on full thing. <laughs> <laughs> So then it's really like you take a bite and you kind of spit it out, which is gross. But um, <laughs> yes, I got plenty of uh, free food while I was filming anyway. Uh, so it was great fun. I really loved it. And uh, and then, you know, at the end, after a couple of years, of, well, not even, I think it was like a year and a half of doing that, I went to visit my sister who lived in California at the time and thought, hey, if this is what I want, this is where I need to be. So went back drove my very beat up Honda Accord across country. I really didn't think it was going to make it across country, but <laughs> we both did. And uh, that was really the beginning for me. And that was when I realized, wow, I don't know what I'm doing. I had taken some acting classes at college. I had had this commercial experience, but I had no idea. Like it's a business, you know, right. and uh, I started to really 
plunge in and <clears throat> I got an agent, a manager and and the commercial agent. I did, I continued to do pretty well commercially, thankfully. Uh, yeah. And then I eventually, I actually screen tested. I, I kind of love sharing this because I think it's such a great um, example of how you should never quit if there's something you really, really want. But I screen tested eight times until I booked um, a show. Wow. So the screen test is the final audition you do, you know, audition, a callback, and then they even negotiate your entire contract. So you go in, you're up, it's down to like four or five of you at that point, And you go into the studio, you work with the actual actor, they film it, and uh, the network comes in and, and helps decide at that point. So eight times, including once for Guiding Light, uh, wow. the role of Mindy was actually my very first um, theatrical audition. And I was screen tested, <laughs> but obviously Barbara Crampton got it. I did not. Um, right. So it wasn't until the, the, the eighth one <laughs> that I got Lucy. So if there's something you want, don't give up. Just keep was there any, going. Was there anyone uh, that you screen tested with and you went from cutting light? Um, yes, actually, uh, the, oh shoot, what's the name of the role? Um, there was somebody who, who they did book. There's often, even when I, um, screen tested for, for guys, um, they, you know, that's actually how they ended up getting, um, Frank Beatty for Marion, um, was he was oh, screen right. testing for another role and they really liked him. And so later they, they, <sighs> they brought him in. Um, Shoot, I don't remember, but there was another girl who was cast um, in some other role like a year later. What was your first day like on the set? Oh gosh, the first day was really fun because uh, I uh, I was working with a radio host at the time. He was doing like a walk on, and I was supposed to dump a bucket of ice on his head. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke a challenge before the challenge. <laughs> it was, it really was. So I was like this sassy, you know, waitress. And uh, and I went up and I don't know, he said something that I didn't like. And so I took my bucket of ice and just like poured it over, poured it over his head. It was kind of fun. But, you know, the first day you're trying to remember everybody's name. You're trying to hit your mark. You're trying to remember your name, you know, like your lines and uh, adding in a whole other big kind of action and trying to get that right on camera on the right, the right time. It was, I was really, really nervous. <laughs> well, if my memory serves me correctly, when you first hit Springfield, I think you uh, actually ran in, ran over Alan Michael or hit him with the car. I didn't hit, I did not hit him, but I did, I did, um, I, I, I can't, I like, yeah, I drove in and I saw him. He was the first person right. that I saw. I didn't, I didn't actually hit him, oh, okay. <laughs> but we did have an interaction for sure. And, uh, yes, I think my sassiness at the time <laughs> got the better of that conversation. <laughs> well, I mean, you joined probably the most fun family on that show, the Coopers. I mean, come on. Uh, my goodness, talk! I was so lucky, so so lucky. Although working with Justin, speaking of like my first day of working with him was terrifying because I mean, such a talented actor and such a nice guy and hilarious in real life. Like nothing but the most amazing things to say about everybody I worked with. Really on on Guiding Light. Um, but he is known for doing things to kind of throw you off course, which when you're starting, the last thing you need is to like have another variable. <laughs> so I remember it was my 10th day. I had had full pack days. And uh, I, I remember the guy Morgan who played Dylan, he had told me in early on, he was like, yeah, you know, you could have 50, 60 pages of dialogue. And I thought, 60 pages of dialogue? How do you remember it? And he's just like, you know, you'd be surprised. Well, it was. It was that 10th day. And I had, I think it was like 54 pages of dialogue. And my brain was oh, wow. fried. And it was later in the day on Friday. And I had a scene with Justin. And I remember standing outside the diner. I was coming in. 
and the countdown was coming five, four, and then you would count off three, two, one, and then enter. And uh, I remember thinking, I have absolutely no idea what I have to say. <laughs> no. But somehow uh, I walked in and words came out of my mouth and they apparently were the right ones because they didn't cut me off. But midway through that scene, you know, Justin decided it would be really fun to just like put me in a headlock, give me a movie, and then oh, no. throw me over his shoulder. So oh, any wow. like any remembering anything at that point was completely gone. <laughs> so much for just the one take, huh? Oh, exactly. Thank goodness you it wasn't live. But uh, uh boy, just I mean so many great actors and between all of the Coopers and Rick, you know, with Alan Michael, sure. I was so blessed. It was really an incredible, incredible experience. Yeah. That, that show definitely had a grand cast mm-hmm. for it sure. It really did. It um, did. Well, speaking of you had, you had a lot of drama in that role as well. Um, <laughs> you think? <laughs> well. I, I, a little, uh, that had to be crazy. I mean, to play the scenes, I mean, one of the scenes you were raped in by Marion, who was actually a man. <laughs> and uh, that had to, I mean, to play that intense of a role or situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I actually did a speech once for a group of uh, actors in like a, a, an acting school. And I started as if it was my real life. Like, you know, I was, I lost, I came into, you know, came to get my trust fund. My mom had died when I was young. And then I, you know, hooked up with this really wealthy guy. And then I was raped, you know, and then I was stalked by this person. And you could see people in the audience like, Holy crap, did that really happen to you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> By the time I got to shipwrecked on my honeymoon, they were like, really? This just doesn't sound right. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. I had them there for a while. But um, yes, it was a very, very intense, particularly the, the rape storyline, because it's a very serious topic and there are a lot of unfortunately yes. women and some men who um who've experienced that extraordinary trauma and uh, i was very active at the time doing a lot of talk shows where i was uh, giving the rape hotline and trying to encourage right. people to get help in fact it it really was one of my most rewarding moments on that show was uh there was a day i got a letter from a young girl who said that she had been raped the same day that Lucy had been raped, but she went to get help the same day Lucy went to get help. Oh, that's awesome. That I know. To, that had I to like be a still great kind of like get a little teary eyed on that one. It really was a moment where I, I, I realized what an impact that we have. And yeah, soaps are fun and, and sometimes a little crazy, you know, but, we came into people's living rooms every day and they did deal with at the time, you know, rather forward thinking topics. And so um, it was, that was, that was a really um, meaningful moment. And it was a hard storyline. Yeah. It was like very, very intense. Um, Yeah. I remember a lot of exhausted days coming home. And maybe even a little paranoid days where I'd be like, is that person following me? Is that person? I actually, one of the stories that I incorporated uh, and, and which didn't always happen, but the guiding light was very receptive. Um, I had decided to take a self-defense class. I think partially because, you know, I had been studying so much about this. I'd interviewed people. I knew people who had, had suffered from uh, rape and I just thought, no, maybe it would be a good thing to have. Um, especially when I'm carrying all this kind of energy around. And so I did, I did this uh, pretty intensive self-defense class and it was very powerful and useful. And so I asked Guiding Light if they would consider integrating it into the storyline and they did, which was really great. Um, But yeah, that was something that I did even just as a means of like, you know, dealing, coping with some of all of the emotions and all of the things that, you inevitably carry a little with you when you're in the midst of such a heavy duty storyline. 
Right. Well, well, with again, I was lucky. You know, Frank Beatty, amazing, talented actor, and just you know, super great human being. So I was, I was really like, I, mean, I felt like I was. I was cared for very much by the people right. I was working with. Well, I mean, back to your the self defense. I mean, that's that would be empowering for any woman who yes. doubts them, especially ones who doubt themselves or or fear. That's yes. just it's got to be part of taking your life back. A hundred percent, and I would say that most of the people in the class had experienced something. Um, and that was partly why they were doing, and I think, you know, I know we'll talk motor size later, but we know just from a brain and an emotional and muscle memory component, you know, that experience very much gets locked into your nervous system. And so we can kind of get frozen in that fear and in that trauma and that time period. And so this is a really great way to sort of physicalize something else that is much more um, empowering and uh, helps release some of that. Obviously, not everything, but some of that from your nervous system too. Right. Uh, yeah, we'll get to motor size in a minute because yeah. I, I want to go into that in depth because that's awesome. My next question is where you float over to One Life to Live to a totally <laughs> different character than you play <laughs> on Guiding Light <laughs> as Nurse as Nurse Barbara Graham. <laughs> As I lovingly say, psycho nurse Barbara Graham. <laughs> uh, I couldn't say that. So, <laughs> what was that like playing? I mean, she was a little obsessed... troubled. Um... She was a little obsessive with Kevin, I think, Buchanan, if memory serves. Just a little bit. Just a little. Uh, yes, she definitely was. Um, I mean, that was just a just as from an actor's standpoint, a really fun opportunity just because it was so different. I mean, poor Lucy literally had like <laughs> just every bad thing from the, you know, the rape, the AIDS, to kidnap, to shipwreck, to like fire, to everything. You know, she had so many That's not even counting things. the breakups and makeups. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So um, to sort of go from that to, to this was it was really it was it was fun. Um, it was a fun chance to sort of create something completely different. Uh, Not to compare them, but was it like two totally different worlds working with different casts like the cast are going to like to all my children? Yes, it really was. It was a very different experience. Um, yeah. I was on Guiding Light a little longer and, you know, as you, as you said, the Coopers were just, <laughs> and you know what, so many people on Guiding Light were amazing, not just the Coopers, but the Coopers were pretty exceptional. Uh, <laughs> you know? Well, the, to me, the Coopers were more of the comic relief version. I mean, not all the time, but uh, compared to the Spaldings and the Lewises, right. I mean, you know. Right, exactly. I think the, the only one who didn't cut up was... Uh, Frank. Yeah. Oh, everybody exactly. else was just crazy. <laughs> I mean, come on, maybe kind of thing, but right, yeah. Harley. He was he was very serious. He took things more serious than everybody else did. <laughs> oh my big brother. Elena was good. Elena was good for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, it was a very different experience. Um well you, you know, went from being the kidnapped to being and the uh, being a the one being attacked to being the aggressor exactly <laughs> especially towards Cassie <laughs> poor Cassie I know. poor Cassie I that know that character went through so much in that her career <laughs> <laughs> but I think she kind of got you back after she got her in the wheelchair and everybody thought she was still paralyzed and she got you in that church steeple. She got you. <laughs> yeah, I went down on that one. I'm not sure there, but <laughs> yeah. so what made you decide to leave acting at that point? Oh wow! You know, it, I I don't know that it was as definitive as at that point. Um, right. I was always looking to grow. Growth is a huge part of just me and who what I want, and it's why I guess I left Guiding Light, why I left One Life to Live was, you know, what 
what else can I do to sort of grow as a person? And as a, as you know, at that point too, still acting was very much in my mind. Um, and so that was why I left those shows. Um, yes, but you went on to, was, yeah, you went on to something even bigger. We're fixing to talk about so much yeah. more. So I think I, when I left, I, it, it sort of simultaneously came to when I, I had, got pregnant. And so that also kind of put me on a little bit of a hiatus at that time. And so I wasn't just, right. I wasn't working as much auditioning as a pregnant person. And uh, during that time, I decided I was going to get uh, certified as a coach, as a life coach. I, um, I had been so passionate about mindset. It had played such a pivotal role in my life particularly between Guiding Light and, and One Life to Live. Because when I left Guiding Light, I had a little bit of that imposter syndrome. I really did. I left believing, you know, like, that's it. <laughs> I just walked right. away from the last job I'm ever going to have in my life, you know. And um, I, I definitely feared that it wasn't going to work. And I carried that fear with me into everything I did. Um, and I didn't work for a pretty long time until I started to really shift the mindset. And so that was a really important part of um, my career. And so I think in studying it, I also became a bit of the person that people would come to whenever they needed help or advice or what do you think? And uh, so I thought, well, maybe it would be fun to actually have some training in it and officially be able to do it or do it even more skillfully and so i got certified and and then as soon as i i had my daughter i was really went back to everything i was like i'm gonna be a coach i'm gonna be a speaker i'm gonna be an actress i'm gonna be a mom and i'm gonna do it all <laughs> and i was kind of not doing anything well <laughs> you know, that was what i realized so it was spread so thin and uh I, I think in in the coaching and in the speaking, I, I really I realized a bit how I felt that day with the, with that letter. You know, it was so amazing to really be able to impact somebody's life, to really be able to help them, and to be able to share some of what I had done um, to help them sort of fast track it. And so I really loved the coaching and the speaking. Um, it's pretty so amazing just, how she kind of, that letter didn't just have an impact on her. It had an impact on you, your life. Yes. Right. Talk about a ripple effect. And then, you know, the people that I've helped and those people who've helped people. That's, I, and I, I love that you pointed that out. Yeah. Thanks. Because I think that is the impact all of us can have. You know, you just never know how one person can change. Um and have that domino effect. And so, yeah, so that was when I really shifted, um, shifted gears and put a lot more energy towards the coaching and uh, speaking at the time. I mean, speaking was a little bit of a fluke, kind of like my acting career. You know, it was like some, I met a speaker and I was like, do you do this for a living? Like you speak to people? <laughs> I, like, I didn't even know that that was a thing really. Um, right. But I joined the National Speakers Association in, in New York. And two years later, I was the president of the National Speakers Association. <laughs> in <New York>. Can't <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> and Toastmasters and all of those places where you can develop those skills. And so, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I really love that process. And through that, the Moda Size grew. So it started and so with you coaching. start your company next. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just okay. giving you the lead intro into that. You start your own company with Moda Size. Yeah. You want to tell us what Moda Size is? Sure. So I was coaching, right? So I was already doing, uh, you know, working one-on-one -on -one and doing some workshops with people. And my daughter, you know, was still young. And then I had my son. So now I had two kids and I was really, you know, not having a lot of time. <laughs> and, um, and I was thinking, you know, I'm not doing the mindset stuff as effectively or as much as I know would be good for me. And I had, you know, it's like my 20 minutes at the gym. That was about what I was working out at the time. And I was running on the treadmill watching these really bad, you know, TV news because that's what they are on those huge giant screens in front of you where you 
can't not see it. And I was just thinking, God, this is such a depressing way of working out. Um, wouldn't it be cool and really efficient if I could just do my mindset stuff in these 20 minutes? That would just cover all my bases. I'd get my exercise and do my mindset, and then I could go off and do everything else. New moms are always looking for ways to kind of um, do that sort of a thing. And uh and that, but that really was the day that I decided. I was like, well, what if I did do that? You know, and I was running on the treadmill, probably no mistake that I created Modicize while moving. And I was running and I was coming up with all these ideas of like how I could guide people through a process around goals or around envisioning or asking different questions and all of these different mindset processes that I knew were effective and could really help right. create change. And I, I take little notes in my phone and then I kind of went home and put it in a drawer for a little bit. And, and then a few months later, I decided I was telling somebody about it and they were like, I would do that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> you know? And so I started and I, I gathered a few people and I just started to try to develop it and figure out, well, what is this? And, uh, and that was also was kind of coming out at the same time. It was a little, just a little later than um, there was a book published by a uh, brilliant um, um, neuropsychologist, psychiatrist, uh, research scientist out of Harvard called John Rady. And he had written a book called Spark. And it was really what busted open the research on the brain when you exercise. And there was a person in Chicago, a gym teacher, who thought gym was kind of silly because, you know, the good people would play and the bad people would figure out how they could mm. never be at gym, right? Right. <laughs> well, got my sneakers, you know, got a note. <laughs> I was going to say, I always had a note. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had no sports I didn't like, and once I did, I'd play, right? So he went right. Wrong. <laughs> but and he just thought it's such a it's such a good thing. Everybody needs it, but how could we do it better? And so he started to play around, and um, and he tried a lot, but landed on bringing everybody in and having them wear heart rate monitors, and they would have to get their heart rate up to their set point. So it was very individualized, whatever level you were at. So some were walking, some were jogging, some were running, and they had to do this every day. And then throughout the day, it was also exercise was interspersed. And what they found in the school system was after a year, besides that they had 3% obesity rate, which is significantly lower That's these huge. days. That's like very, very low. They also, there's a a worldwide test in science and math. And uh, they ended up doing number one in science and number six in math. And the US had never scored that high. We had um, typically some of the Asian countries scored the highest um, and we beat them. And so it was very noteworthy. And so uh, John Rady thought this was interesting and decided to go and study. And what he was finding was this exercise program that the gym teacher developed was really unique. And that was when they started to study the brains of these kids and found that exercise actually creates neurogenesis, which is the production of new brain cells and new neural pathways. So new, um, like you can literally change your neural pathways. So if you're habituated to one thing, you can change it to something else. You're more creative, you're more focused, your memory is better, your it, depression is like, it's probably the best antidepressant ever. Anxiety goes down um, in addition to all the other health benefits. So it was pretty massive science that was coming out of that study. Uh, and there was another teacher who got wind of that book and she actually tried it in what they call the last resort school in up in Canada. Um, it was a bunch of students who had basically been kicked out of every other school and sent here. So learning disabilities, uh, behavioral, dis you know, challenges, all kinds right. of issues. And that had the same thing, had them running on treadmills, got treadmills into classrooms. Those kids, unreal. Like some of them went entire grade levels up. 400% wow. change in scores on test scores. Uh, there were kids who were actually were, you know, notorious for cutting school, were actually coming to school because they wanted to be there. They wanted, they were feeling better. They weren't depressed. They wanted to actually work out. Right. Um, 
it was huge. And so that catapulted the science into what we know today, which is continuing to grow. But anyway, that was a big, long tangent to say it uh, also sort of worked in tandem with what I was doing. It was, hey, we know your brain is very open and, and um I'd even go so far as to say susceptible to what the input that you're putting in when you are working out. Hence, watching, you know, really negative programming when you're in that wide open brain place isn't really all that great. Um, It's just sort of- So I don't want to watch a pizza commercial I'm exercising. Exactly. You definitely (laughs) don't. You actually really don't. No doubt you're going to leave there and that pizza image is going to be locked into your brain. Right. (laughs) And you're just going to throw away all that great work you did. So, yeah. So that was really um, the very foundational to the, to what Monosize is. So it was developing this life coaching process that I put into exercise or into movement. And I, and, you know, there's various levels. I think I came out of the gate thinking I'm going to transform exercise. And, and I realized, you know, it does take a little bit of um, focus, you know, you have to actually want to do the mindset work and uh, some, Sometimes people don't. They just want to do the exercise, which is totally fine. Um, so I was going to say because I've been, I've actually been doing some of your moto minutes, which we'll get to. Uh, but you said uh, transform exercise. You're not just doing exercise, though. You're transforming the mind and positive thinking along the way. Absolutely. It's me. That's really what I'm doing. It's really. It is a mindset thing. And you just happen to be doing exercise because that enhances it, that makes that happen faster, more effectively, and um, and more long lasting. Like it can actually create lasting change because you are working with changing those brain um, pathways. So uh, I, it is, and you can use any goal. It doesn't have to be a fitness goal. It could be you know something with the relationship. Or I've had people come up with business. I've had people come up with business ideas that now are really successful or business strategies. I had a, a guy come, who was selling his company come up with an entire strategy about how to go about it. And he ended up selling for like nine figures. It was huge. Wow. And people transform family relationships or attract somebody that they, you know, a love relationship. Um, and I've had people have success with you know, health goals, losing weight, all those more traditionally traditional goals that are tied to exercise. But to me, it's, it's about changing your, your mindset. And you do have a book that's going to be coming out soon called what if it, what if it were easy? Um, I know a lot of this, some of this will be covered in the book that we're about to go, go over. I've got some questions for you about the program. Yeah. First, what what's the best practice to succeed on your program? What's the best practice um, to succeed? Do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That, that, uh, that's that's it. Much the best. That is <laughs> that's like, it. Um, I guess sticking it. to it would be the, be the best thing. Then I mean, it's not I mean, something you could just do the- one day and then do it again next week. It's not going to be very effective. I wouldn't think. Yeah, I think it's like anything when you're trying to create some change, some level of consistency, particularly in the beginning does help for sure. And, uh, and I also feel this about anything new, like it becomes more fun, the more you do it, because the more you also start seeing the results and you're like, Oh, it's worth it. You know, I I say that to even my kids that are might be just starting a sport or a musical instrument or, you know, or if you cook a meal for the first time and it's a flop, like try it again. Cause like the more you do it, the, the more you're going to see that it works and it can work. And so, and then it becomes fun. And then you actually want to do it because you're like, well, wait, now I need it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So what effects do you think your mind has over your body? Oh, it's huge. I mean, and this we know, the mind is incredible. Um, There are so many studies now that just show uh, what your mindset can do on your body. There was an interesting one I just read. I believe it's out of Ohio University. Um, They literally put casts on people 
and uh, for I think it was six weeks, it may have been four weeks, four to six weeks. Uh, don't quote me on the the time, but it was in that 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 bulk that in that period. Right. Um, they had these people in casts, and one group just wore the cast and went about their life. The other group had to for fifteen minutes a day. Imagine they weren't doing anything because it was on a cast with their arm, but imagine they were doing certain exercise to strengthen that arm. And at the end of that four or six weeks, the people that were imagining it were 20% stronger. Oh, wow. That's, the other that's people not just little. <laughs> that's not, that's, that's not insignificant. That's... It's right huge there's another massive that well massive a very large study uh they sort of refer to it as the maid study where they also did that splitting in two groups and um they they maids these were maids who thought that they um they wanted to lose weight and they were so busy because their jobs were so busy and they didn't have time to exercise and um half the group was instructed on how much exercise you're actually getting, you know, doing cleaning is not nothing. <laughs> you're moving all day long, vacuuming right. and, you know, changing sheets and all the rest of it. And so every day they were shown videos and taught about how much exercise they actually had done, how many calories they had burned off, what kind of, you know, muscle strength they were getting out of it. Same thing at the end of the month of that, the people who didn't, who just went about their life as normal, no change. But these change, some of them changed as much as a full dress size. Like the wow. circumference of their body was different. They lost as up to an inch. I mean, again, all because they were thinking that. And the more we're able to capture these, these uh, studies, they're showing um, what a huge difference it makes. So, yes, I always say your mindset is powerful so really watch what you're you know you're thinking because it does have an impact you can attract great things i always say my husband my husband's like one of the fastest manifestors i know it's incredible and sometimes really annoying i'm like how did you do that so fast <laughs> right. but when he starts getting into a negative he gets into a negative thing which sometimes he does we're human we all do right and so i'm like you better stop like immediately because you're gonna bring that on stop 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 we have to turn that around um instantly and so um but there's there's some incredible stuff. I, 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 you know, on the sort of more avant-garde, if you will, Dr. Dispenza is doing some interesting work. He's using meditation, um, but it's all about changing your mindset and and uh, shifting. But people are are actually getting over diseases. I mean, there's some pretty interesting work, and I think that this area we are going to see change significantly. One of the area, one of the ways in which we know it has an impact is on your genes. Epigenetics is such a huge field now, but your mindset actually impacts whether your genes sort of up level or down level. And when it goes sort of downgrades, that's when it becomes more susceptible to certain diseases or um, issues or anything. It could be mental health, it could be physical. Um, but when it's sort of up level, then you're going to be in the highest expression of that gene, which is greater health, both mental and physical. And we know mindset has a direct correlation on, on that um, gene expression now. So, and we also know from that um, exercise and meditation do too. I often see those as like, two sides of the same coin like they're both really um quite transformational so i'm actually adding in meditation into part of what i do too because i think it's great to have both i think you need to be active but i think it's also good to have stillness my brother teaches meditation does classes um yeah. i've tried it uh what would you suggest for someone like me i don't have adhd i say i have a adhd brain though because it's so much going on you know around in there that I can't shut it off to meditate. Yeah. Is there a process to help get to that point to where you can shut it off for a little bit? So I have a couple answers to that. Um, from a 
completely and utterly just practical trying to fast track right. it. Um, one could exercise a little bit before exercise first, even if it's just a walk. It doesn't and like you don't have to go do a boot camp, but just something to sort of expend a little bit of that energy. And that will help your brain start to release this protein that helps create focus. So that, that could be one area that you could try. Um, the other thing I would say is I think there's a lot of um, anxiety that comes up around, I have to turn my brain off. <laughs> I have to stop <laughs> thinking, right? And because I had this, I had the same thing. I'm like, I can't stop thinking. I just like, you've been. Well, I've got that fear. Think- you got that fear. Oh my God, did I forget to do this? Oh, yes. what about that? <laughs> exactly. I had that so much, or, you know, I don't want to shut it off. It's like great creative things are coming, right? And uh, I think one of the best things a teacher told to me is you're not really trying to turn it off. Like human beings think. We're thinking it's part of what makes us different from, uh, you know, sets us apart from our animal. friends right and so but what we can do is we can slow it and i think that's really a greater goal is to put more space in between your thoughts um because we also know as much as we like to think that our fast-paced minds are helping us our optimal brain is and most creative self is actually moving at a slightly slower pace you'll actually tune in to more um more creative and more uh in alignment you'll be able to hear that sort of what i like to call body intelligence or your instinct or your gut um by slowing things down a little the more you have racing thoughts um the more you're kind of operating from a slightly stressed space uh i actually did a whole uh facebook live on it yesterday but um, yeah, we really, that. yeah, I'm so <laughs> bummed. It got so like weirdly interrupted, but anyway, um, we become a little addicted to our emotions, and so, and it's this stress is a form of an emotion. We can become very addicted to our stress. Uh, I know I shared yesterday on that Facebook Live. I was I just did this wisdom quest, so I was literally camping outside for uh five days all by myself no food just water and uh i had lots of time on my hands and nowhere to go like i really didn't have anything i had to do (laughs) and so of course there were some natural stressors that come from just the you know getting into your head about oh my god i'm out in the middle of nowhere by myself and i have no food right so barring Mm -hmm. those that are real just sort of survival anxieties that popped up from time to time what i noticed was pretty much every day um six to eight times a day i literally would feel anxious and i started by the third day i was like what is going on what am i really anxious about (laughs) like and there's nothing happening i'm not in my life i don't have my kids i don't have my work i don't even have a phone like i have nothing like there's nothing other than it's habitual and that was when i really started to notice wow we are so habituated to stress that we create it and then sometimes we put in the mindset to match it so that we can justify it. So I think it goes both ways. We have this habitual stress and then we also have these thoughts that create the habitual stress. That's the most in, habitual thing in the world right now. In the world, it is. And when I'm home, oh my God, you know, and I will jump and pop and do all those things. And that is part of what creates that sort of fast, an ineffective brain. So, yeah, but how to did you do the question when... about the meditation? Just so I can okay. close that circle because I didn't. Is one take a little bit of the pressure off of yourself so that you're not getting anxious about the fact that you are not stopping thinking. Just be conscious of it and just in a non-judgmental way, be like, "Oh, there's a thought. There's another." And there's a couple of different techniques. Sometimes. I actually don't, I don't personally use this one because it brings me into TV mode, which sets me off on another tangent, but you can imagine your thoughts just passing on a screen. Some people use that. So just sort of watch it go by. I happen to like um, just imagining it going in a stream of water and just watching it kind of trickle. Um, You can blow it and just sort of watch it float. 
Um, but sometimes these are little tricks, if you will, or techniques you can use to help um, slow the thoughts down and just breathe and calm yourself. Guided meditations, I think, can be really, really helpful when you're starting. And the final thing I would say about meditation is to set a timer. So you're not also doing the, am I done yet? Am I done yet? <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Right? That, like, me. I got five minutes. I, I really can't stop. I can slow down my thinking for five minutes. Like, that's not unreasonable. Um, you know, and so and so you go into it sort of in a, in a better frame of mind with parameters, some tricks, and, some, and sort of like releasing the judgment and the anxiety about having felt. Anyway, long answer. There you go. <laughs> I, I know you've got a YouTube channel, which I was mentioning earlier, where any where everybody can find your what you call motor minutes. Yeah. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. So I do a lot of these motor minutes because now you know sometimes you just need that quick change, right? And uh, so it's there's this whole lot. I don't even know how many I have up there. Quite a lot, actually. There's several. Um, yeah, I've been doing them for. And each one is you have is for directed at a specific area. Exactly. Like, so certain mindsets. So right. if uh, so, if there's something that's coming up for you, um, it's just one mindset idea matched with a movement. And in the Modi minutes, what I do is I, I try very much to tie the physical motion to the mindset. So it again, it's sort of a little. NLP thing, if you will, it gets it into your muscle memory and into your nervous system and into your brain in a different way. Uh, for example, like one of the questions I ask is, what do you have? I love that question, by the way, because often when we come to a challenge, we think of all the things we don't have, <laughs> right. all of the lack, all of the things, the obstacles that are standing in our way. So by shifting gears and taking a look at what what do you have even if it's a great idea i have the energy i have a passion i have you know a computer i have a little bit of support whatever it might be right so taking a look at what you have and say i might move it into like a bicep curl so you're pulling in what do i have let's pull that in let's pull that in so that's an idea of um or if it's like, what's an obstacle, let's jump over it or let's, you know, or let's burn it or dump it or, you know, something like that. So it's tied a mindset to a movement. Well, I know on your website, if anybody wants to visit us on the screen, um, you've got different programs for different things. Um, does it matter if you're disabled or overweight No. to be able to do them? Yeah. It, uh, no, it doesn't. I would say the DVD, if you're disabled or overweight, will probably be a little more challenging. There are some, there are modifications, but I've modified it significantly um, since then. And uh, I have worked, I actually have a program that's not quite up on my website yet. It's a, uh, it's a three month, um, very like hands on lose weight, gain energy, or simply just feel healthy in your body program. So it's one-on-one -on -one coaching and a half hour motorcycle session once a week, plus full access. You can text or call or whatever to reach me so that we can try to like make the change in the moment. Um, and in that motorcycle session, I absolutely tailor it because I do. I have some people who aren't very mobile. And so there's always something you can do. And, I, you know, I'll say, too, even if you just do the mindset piece, like even if you were to sit and watch the DVD and not do it, you would still benefit from the process if you go through it. Um, I also have an audio, so you can do the process if you wanted to walk or if you wanted to do just very simple exercises, like if you were in a, a wheelchair or or you had other disabilities where you weren't able to use um it, it, you know, certain different functions. So it, it, it absolutely can be modified um, for wherever you're at. I think that's really important um, because but again, you would, you would yeah. be able to work with that person if they bought a, one of the packages that you've offered, you would be able yeah. to help them modify that to their A hundred percent. Yes, I definitely would. Particularly the one-on-one -on -one 
stuff. That's where I really do the modifications for it. So I, I just uh, think what you're doing is so great. I, that's why I'm trying to talk about it so much because I think people should look into it and should check out your website uh, and your yeah. YouTube channel because there's you you make so much sense. <laughs> you make so much <laughs> sense. You make things where I, you know it's like, oh yeah, I never thought about that, and, yeah. and you make people feel good. Yeah. You just do. Um, I guess I'll ask one more question because I know we're getting close. Um, yeah. With all that you do, your mother, how do you balance work and home life? Because that's got to be crazy. Yeah. Uh, sometimes better than others. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I think I've, um, I really... I dug in very, very hard to the um, desire to be able to do it all brilliantly all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was convinced that was possible and I was going to prove it. And I, um, I, I, I learned that maybe you can't do it all perfectly all of the time. Um, right. And so I, I started to really kind of work more towards a life of fulfillment you know and i think things come in waves like there are you know there are shifts in in what needs your attention what needs your intention um and i really try to follow that you know my family is still number one and that was also something that i i learned or i accepted early on was for me that was a priority um it was really important to me that i was going to be be there um, in some capacity. And so I just realized, okay, things are just going to happen a little slower. Um, you know, they're a little older now. They're, they don't need me around all the time. Um, don't want me around all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> now, I, you know, I'm making a huge, much greater shift, like with the book coming out and doing promo and, and I'm working more and traveling more and doing things like that. And so I think it's, it's take, it's, on my site, I actually have this wheel of life. It's a little quiz. I kind of like it. And I, I took do. It. I, did you take it? <laughs> yes, I took it. I, I still take it because it changes. You know, what I mean? like, what do you need to redo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took it. It's, it's a really neat program you have on there. I mean, your site's just awesome. I love your site. Oh, that's so great. Well, so and what do. it is, is it really, it's just like numbering the different key areas of your life, like on a scale of one to 10, where are you at? And it's just such a great little like picture. It's a, it's a snapshot of where you're at. Right. It shows you what your, what your, what your day like, your day in your life is like, exactly. how much you spend on this, that, and the other. Right. And so, you know, it's like a wheel in your car, you know, like if you don't have the full, or at least you don't, well, maybe not in any given day, but in a given week or a couple of weeks, you're going to be running on a flat tire or something. And you know? so, right. you know, and, and what I find is people tend to put a lot of energy on the things that they're really good at or that are going well. And then they kind of forget about the things that they're not so good at. <laughs> and so it's just, it's a, it's a really a tool just to say, Hey, give those areas some love too. And, uh, they, all aspects need it and all will help build to make a better life. For sure. You should check out the Moda Minutes on YouTube, Miss Setter's YouTube channel. You'll find more information on how to contact her and more about her program on her website. Don't forget to find the book, What If It Were Easy, when it comes out here very soon. Yes. Thank you for being here, Sonia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. And I conti I plan on continuing to do my Moda Minutes. Excellent. Sure. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> and if anyone has any questions, like if they, if they listen to this later and they wish that they had been here live, you know, please just reach out to me. I'm very, um, I really do want to be able to answer your questions, acting or um, Moda size or health or mindset. Um, you know, just feel free. You can reach me via my site and uh, send I've me got, an email. I'll I've got it. all your links in the description that'll stay there for anybody who watches it later or now. Perfect. Um, thank you for being here. If you can hang out backstage for just a couple minutes, I'll be back there in just a minute. Yeah. Thanks. I'd like to thank Sonia Satra for being here today. Uh, you can follow our social media on all our links in the description of the video. 
I hope you do. If you enjoyed the show, please hit the subscribe button for more great shows that's going to be coming up. And please remember to be kind to one another. Have a great day.